I want to welcome you all to our first All Things Zoom interview. And I couldn't be happier that it's an old friend and actually one of our most frequent guests. Please welcome back Chittenden County Senator Debbie Ingram. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Now, we have a lot to talk about because life as we knew it in January has changed in many ways. One, by virtue of how the Senate is operating and the bills you're looking at, and also something that you might be doing for the next step in your political career. So let's talk first about the Senate and how are you all doing with this new reality? It is a new world. For sure. Well, we are doing this same thing that you and I are doing now. We're doing a lot of Zoom uh, remote meetings. And um, actually, I'm on uh, the Health and Welfare Committee. And so we immediately jumped in to pass some emergency legislation to make sure that our healthcare system was working well for Vermonters as we began dealing with the pandemic. So uh, I have been um, on committee meetings. Well, three to four days a week, uh, which we would have done anyway if we met in person um, in health and welfare. And then we've had all Senate um, meetings together. And then we finally made the transition to actually being able to have um, quote unquote floor sessions uh, by Zoom. Um, so we've been doing business and, and actually passing legislation. So now, it's quite a steep curve. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna, now, do any of you actually come into the building anymore? We did at the very beginning. We had, uh, we've had two sessions since this all began uh, with only 16 of us, because that's a, that's a quorum in the Senate. And uh, we, had to pass, we had to pass some legislation before we um, gave ourselves permission to do things remotely. So we, we've done that twice and we, we so we were socially distant and we, you know, wore our masks and our gloves and, you know, we, we, we followed the guidelines, but now we can do everything remotely. Now, and this has worked out well. And if I, as a constituent, have an interest in a particular piece of legislation, is there a way that I can track it in committee and see what it is that the committee is taking for action or testify if I wanted to? Yes, yes. So our web, the legislative website is still functioning well and updated all the time. And so you can see our agendas when a piece of legislation is coming up. And then when we're actually in session um, meeting, we have our um, Zoom sessions are, bro are broadcast on YouTube. So you can follow along on YouTube, but if you wanted to testify, then you'd have to contact the chair and the committee assistant beforehand and be invited into the Zoom platform. So we are trying to avoid having Zoom bombing, which has unfortunately happened. <laughs> uh, so that's why we, we put it on YouTube for people to watch. Now, you had mentioned that health and welfare had passed and, and very quickly some COVID specific pieces of legislation. In other states, there's been some conflict between the legislature and the administration about how the administration had approached COVID. How do you all feel about what our administration has been doing and their approach? I think on, for the most part, we're, we've all been very pleased with how the administration has handled things and we, um, um, we especially appreciate the caution and the ability to listen to our scientists and our doctors to make decisions, which is something, of course, we don't see at the national <laughs> level necessarily, so we're happy to see that. I think the biggest concern we have, though, is um, the um, lack of preparation for the huge number of claims for unemployment insurance. 
and how uh, that has really been uh, a kind of a mess, uh, to use a technical term, um, <laughs> when people have been calling in and trying to make claims, and then when um, they've had issues or problems with their claim, trying to get back into the system to get somebody to correct it. And, th and that has truly been a, a terrible hardship on many Vermonters because they've had to go for weeks with their claim not being processed properly and then uh, not getting any, not having any income. And so really um, we've, we've unfortunately heard from some very desperate folks. That, that's been the worst part of the response so far. Now, is it possible that the legislature is gonna step in and take action or are you somewhat confident with how the administration has tried to turn that around? Well, that is really a function of the Department of Labor. So um, what the legislature has been able to do is put pressure on them. We've, you know, we've had the uh, commissioner come in and speak uh, to us in various settings several times. Um, we have uh, individually um, uh, emailed and called different employees in the Department of Labor. Um, the House members actually did take it upon themselves to be able to enter the portal that the Department of Labor runs to actually check on individual cases of constituents. Um, so they've done some of that. So, so we've tried to do as much as we possibly can, although it, I mean, it is essentially an administrate, administrative function. Now, building off what you had said about, you know, we had Vermonters who were waiting for a paycheck and waiting for the additional monies that had been promised to come in. I noticed that the legislator, legislature had taken action to try and put in place moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures. You know, are, are we likely to see more of those types of actions? I think that we've done, um, we've laid a good foundation. We, we did pass um, uh, that legislation. Um, we've, we've reached out to financial institutions and to landlords uh, also and have um, encouraged individuals to, to do that because we, we have been told that there are a lot of um, um, institutions that are, that are um, willing to work with their uh, people who've borrowed from them um, to, to work out a different payment schedule. So, um, you know, we've taken quite a bit of action uh, in, a, in a lot of different areas. And I think at this point, we feel like we've, uh, we've covered most of the essential uh, things um, right now. So we're actually beginning to move towards some of the legislation that we had passed out of committee before the crisis began. And we're uh, just yesterday, we started expanding to look at some of the bills that we were trying to pass before this all started. Which is a wonderful segue into the other than COVID. You all had, and you personally had some priorities of actions that you wanted to see during this second year of the biennium. What are those pieces of legislation that you're really hopeful are still gonna see some action? And is there a sense of how long the session might now last? because I had seen some of the public media reporting that with the remote accessing and you know all of the changes that were needed to take in place, that you all might still be meeting remotely into the fall. That's right. Well, some of the um, legislation that I'm particularly interested in um, is some of the climate change um, bills. Uh, um, I've, I've been on the climate caucus and um, climate solutions caucus um, and especially the global warming solutions act uh, the house passed that so it's coming over to the senate we also in the senate we passed a bill called the justice reinvestment to um, act and that would help to reduce the population in our prisons and improve programming uh, for inmates so that when they get out they are more likely to succeed um, so we're, we are hoping the House will take that up. Um, there are a variety of, since I'm on education and, and health and welfare, there are a variety of uh, 
different uh, bills that we've been working on um, in education, uh, delaying our change changes in special education so that we're better prepared for them, um, and also restructuring how the teacher healthcare bargaining um, happens. So some of those, you know, some of those things are still important to us. Um, but yes, the, in terms of the schedule, um, what we're being told now is that hopefully uh, we'll be able to do the budget adjustments for this year, and then we'll pass a, uh, a limited budget for just the first quarter of FY21. Hopefully we're gonna get that done by mid-June, then we'll stop from mid-June through the primary, through about mid-August, and then we'll go back to uh, have a better sense of how much federal money we'll, we'll be getting, what our revenue looks like, so that we can do a budget for the rest of fiscal year 21. So that's what we're looking at now. Okay, so a couple of things that you touched on quickly. I mean, first, climate change. I mean, certainly with the stay-at-home orders, we've seen some of the dramatic benefits from reducing carbon footprints. But let's talk about education and funding in maybe Vermont colleges. Ah, yes. <laughs> Since you're on the education committee and all of a sudden it became more of a priority than when you thought at the beginning of the session, what are you all thinking and, and how might you all be approaching that? Well, we, we do have a financial crisis in our, in our colleges. We, we were working on um, trying to provide two years of free tuition to Vermonters for community college that we, we had a bill that we were working on when the crisis struck. Uh, because we've heard for many years now that, and it, and it is absolutely true that the state underfunds our colleges. I, I think we're actually 49th in among the 50 states and how much money we invest in our higher education, which, which is dismal, obviously. Um, but we had, <laughs> we, we were, we were taken by surprise uh, with the chancellor's um, kind of nuclear option of actually shutting down some of the um, campuses. And um, that of course catalyzed everybody into action though, because I, you know, the, these, these colleges are, they're important of course for the students, they're important uh, employers for teachers and other staff, and they're really cultural centers in the communities in which they're located. So this would have a devastating effect. Um, you know, all across the state. So, so now um, that, that that proposal has been um, <clears throat> pulled off the table, we're working to use some of the federal funds that we're getting in to, um, to do some transitional funding for a period of time so that we can uh, call in um, a consultant to help analyze the situation and work with the trustees um, and come up with a long-term solution that will uh, make sure that we can keep those colleges open. So might education and free tuition be part of someone's platform who might just happen to be running for lieutenant governor? <laughs> Well, that might be true. It might be true. Well, you know, I um, I am running for lieutenant governor. Thank you for that for that segue. Um, and yeah, truly, I think that this crisis has helped us to shine a bright light on the gaps that we have already in our in our systems. We're we're just seeing um, we're seeing the problem with. Um, education. Um, we're, we're seeing the problems with broadband. We're seeing that if, if Vermonters had been making um, higher wages, they would have had some savings to draw on so that two weeks of not getting paid wouldn't be devastating for them. Uh, we're seeing that if we had paid family leave, that we, that could help tide people over. We're seeing all sorts of problems with our systems. And one of the reasons that um, I'm running for Lieutenant Governor is to, is to say, um, well, let's Yes, this is a crisis, but let's also view it as an opportunity 
because we obviously too were able to um, address some of these problems literally overnight in our our homeless population we were able to to house and you know the Burlington mayor put mo motor homes on North Beach uh, you know we put um, folks in motels it's because we decided as a group and we had the leadership to to know that this this is urgent and we have to do something about it now if we brought that courage and that political will to all of our various problems including college tuition and and all kinds of other things um, then i think we would really see some big changes in our society and that's the kind of vision and the kind of forward thinking that I want to bring to the office of Lieutenant Governor. And from reading your statement on your campaign page, you are someone who has confronted challenges and showed incredible strength and resilience. So what I would ask you is why this move now? What, why is this the time Deb Ingram should be Vermont's Lieutenant Governor. Well, the um, originally the reason I, I, I've been thinking about it for a while, but, but just for a practical reason, um, when uh, David Zuckerman, did, the current Lieutenant Governor, decided to run for governor, it, it created an opening. And, and practically speaking in Vermont, you have to seize those opportunities when, um, when, they, when they come, because they don't come around that often. But, um, but I do think that the timing has, has been really, um, really special because, um, yes, from, you know, from my, um, uh, my early days, my, my dad died when I was 16, um, to um, my early career when I was uh, discriminated against and fired from work because of my sexual orientation, um, to living overseas in a, in a, a developing country in Bangladesh and having to deal with the challenges of, of uh, that um, existence, um, you know, to um, my um, recovery from alcoholism. Uh, all of these kinds of things are, um, um, you know, they make you a seasoned person. And, um, and I think that you, there's no substitute for life experience. And I, I really believe that I'm a candidate that can be compassionate to all of us as we're uh, facing the, the grief and the loss of what we've had to go through in the crisis and also be hopeful and optimistic and help uh, lead people forward to a, a stronger tomorrow. And I've always been impressed by your honesty and integrity and your willingness to respond directly to a situation. So as we are rapidly running out of time, people who want to become involved in your campaign, we will put the contact email address on the screen. You have a series of virtual tours that you are doing? That's right, yes. There are 14 counties in Vermont and we are going to each one uh, virtually. Uh, hopefully at some point, maybe in person, but we're going to each one in turn. So um, uh, each week we're releasing a new video. Uh, next week we'll be releasing the one on Washington County. And I'll be interviewing people who are doing exciting things, either businesses or nonprofits um, in Washington County, uh, talking a little bit about things that are fun to do once we can get out again. And um, also looking at the historical contributions that the county has made. So uh, they'll be on my YouTube channel. You can go to my website, ingramvt.com to get the link. And um, yes, email me if you wanna be on my email list. And the primary is August 11th. That's right. And I, before we started taping, you said that people would probably be receiving postcards, encouraging people to do a mail-in ballot that needs to be received by your town clerk on or before August 11. And you were endorsed by LPAC. Yes, I was. That's right. I'm very excited. Yeah, very pleased. And, and that wasn't a merely here I am and I fit your profile. You needed to be interviewed by them and they needed to say, yes, what you stand for is something we would support. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. And I would be the 
first openly lesbian statewide office holder in Vermont. So. And it would give me more than ample opportunity to come back and say, old friend, it, it's time for us to talk again. I would <laughs> enjoy that very much. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much for being our first Zoom interview and good luck with your campaign. Thank you, thank you, it's been great to be here.